Okay, so kind of bittersweet just uh, here at the office and this video might actually be the last video that I film in this space. Just here today starting the process of moving out of this place and getting ready to go over to the UK. So a little overwhelming, got a ton of shit just everywhere. Stuff that I've accumulated over the, the past few years. So in here today, just figuring out what to do with everything and how I'm gonna get it over to the UK. But as I do this, I figured that it could be kind of fun to make a video just talking about the equipment that I use for my filmmaking work and then also for the video work I do here on YouTube. And then I, I am gonna do kind of a part two looking at the film photography gear I use. I think that is probably a little more well known than this stuff. But my hopes is that this video helps anyone who's curious about the tools I use just because I have had a lot of people asking me questions over the last few videos. Uh, but then also just for anyone who's looking to get into video or even looking to upgrade some of the current equipment that they have right now. So gonna go over what I use, but also going to give some recommendations as alternative choices uh, depending on your budget level. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna start with is the camera. And I actually own two cameras, but I have one that is pretty much the camera that I try and use for everything. The other one, we're filming with right now. I'll talk about it briefly later because I am in the process of swapping it out for something different. But the main camera that I use is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, which is probably my favorite camera that I've ever owned uh, for a number of reasons. But in the past, I've had uh, models by Sony. So I've owned a Sony FS7. Uh, I've owned a Red Scarlet W. I've used Panasonic EVA. I've also owned a Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, which was kind of my A camera, and I bought this as my B camera. But I gotta say, the image out of this camera is super impressive and really, really close or better to some of the other models that I've used in the past, and also really comes close to a lot of cameras that cost a lot more money than this. camera's $1,300 US. Obviously you have to build it out, which you'll see as I talk about some stuff here, but that's really, really cheap for what this thing is capable of. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with this camera, it does 4K, 60, 10-bit uh, ProRes or 12-bit RAW internal. It'll also do, I think, 75 frames per second uh, at 241 widescreen 4K, all internal. No overheating, none of that nonsense. Uh, the color is really nice. Like I said, the image is really nice. The dynamic range is great. Uh, the highlight roll off is really nice. Just as a really pleasing image and it's easy to work with. So when it comes to color grading, it doesn't take much to get some really nice looking colors out of this camera. You don't have to mess around with a bunch of stuff. This camera kind of has become the do it all for me. And what I love about it is you can kind of strip it down, use it handheld with like a lens, or you can build it out. I can still build this camera out and use it on some commercial productions. Like I said, you gotta build this camera out. And the first thing that I'll start with is the mount. So. It's a micro four thirds sensor and mount to begin with, but I'm running all Canon EF lenses on this camera. So I'm using a Metabone Speed Booster. And the nice thing about this is it's giving you a wider field of view. So I think the crop on this camera is 1.85 or 1.9. This is a 0.71 Metabones Speed Booster. And this will bring it out to about, I think 1.3. So it's actually giving you around in the middle of full frame in Super 35 when it comes to field of view. So really nice, this transforms this camera into uh, kind of like a Super 35 cinema camera, a little bit wider than that. And then it also gives you one extra stop of light uh, for your lens. So if you're using a f2.8 lens, it essentially makes it an f2. So this is a must for me. Um, it, I love that it gives me that wider field of view. And then the version that I have is actually the Cine version. So it has this locking Canon EF mount. So you actually don't uh, turn the lens to lock it on here. You put the lens on and turn this mount to lock it down. It's kind of like a PL mount. And then I don't have it installed right now, but there is a Metabones mount that attaches it to this tilt -a cage So it gives you just this super sturdy mount system for your lenses, which is really nice. And then before the mount, and for me, this is a must for the Blackmagic cameras, I have an IR cut and optical low pass filter installed. 
So the Blackmagic cameras, in my opinion, suffer from really bad IR contamination. So if you don't use an IR cut filter, a lot of the times the blacks in your image are gonna look kind of reddish brown, especially when you're using ND filtration and it's almost impossible to correct. It really makes it difficult. So on the Ursa Mini Pro, I actually bought one of these filters. They're by a company called Raw Light and it completely solved that issue. I didn't have to run an IR cut filter on the front of the lens anymore. Uh, and I ordered one uh, basically as soon as they were released for the pocket. And then since it's an OLPF as well, it helps just with like aliasing in an image, uh, like in shirts uh, and fine detail and stuff like that. So for me, for these cameras, it's a must. I think it's like $400, it's not cheap. All of this stuff is adding to the cost of the camera. You don't need to add this stuff, but for me and the way that I use this for the work I do, it really helps and it's something that I, I wouldn't work without. The monitor that I do use is the Small HD 502 Bright. I love Small HD's uh, monitors. This one is a little more expensive. I think it's around $1,000. Just it does have SDI connections as well as HDMI. Uh, really durable, solid build, and then it's the bright version, so I think it's around a thousand nits. Small HD does make cheaper monitors. They make their focus line, which are nice and I think really affordable. What I love about these monitors, just from my experience using them in the past, is that uh, the color's pretty nice on them and then the brightness is nice as well. It's all very accurate. So uh, when I'm not using exposure tools on this camera, I can just expose by eye. So basically, I know that if I'm happy with how the image looks on here, it's gonna look the same when I put it on my computer. And I've used some cheaper monitors in the past, which I know a lot of people use and are happy with, but I've found that there's been a lot of times where I'll be outside, I'll think that I'm like nailing my exposure, and then I'll get back to the computer and my uh, footage will be like half a stop or a stop underexposed, which is a bummer. So small HD stuff is really nice, and that's what I would recommend. Even like I said, the focus line, I'll put some links below. I would recommend checking those out. You can get those if you're on a budget, and uh, they're nice monitors. Then when it comes to kind of rigging this thing out, uh, obviously this is for more of the production work I do. Like I said, one of the things I love about this camera is that I can kind of strip it down or build it up depending on what I'm doing. So I still do use this at times for commercial work. I used it, I think about three weeks ago for a shoot. So I have a bunch of things that I add. I'll just show them real quick. It, obviously I don't use these things for YouTube, but it could be of interest for other people. So this is kind of a, a some of a rig that's built. Obviously I don't always use everything at once, but I'll just, to try and make this somewhat quick, I'll just go over things. So this is the Tilta base plate, which then has uh, obviously 15 mil rail mount on the bottom. And then I'm running just this V mount plate on the back and it has this connection, which is for the 12 volt connector on the side of the camera. So you can plug right in, you get V mount power. You can run this camera like all day off of one battery and these batteries that I'm using are the Indie Pro Tools. They're the 98 watt hour. So yeah, you could probably get a full day shooting out of one of these batteries, which is really nice. And then the uh, mount also tilts as well if you wanna get access to the screen for controls and stuff like that. But obviously I run an external monitor when I'm using that as well. And then I have these uh, shape adjustable handles on a 15 mil rail mount uh, and this base plate. So this is by Tilta. It has their uh, own Tilta dovetail. But the nice thing is, since I'm running the Tilta cage, it just, uh, let's see if we can get this on. So it adapts right to the bottom of the cage and then the shoulder pad slides back and forth for balance. But the nice thing is, is now I can throw this on my shoulder uh, obviously we don't have a lens on it or a matte box, but it's still pretty well balanced. Sits really nice. And then I run just the tilt the top handle, which I gotta say, one of my complaints is they don't have like a hard stop. Sometimes it just takes forever to get this, find how to get this thing screwed in. But so I'll run the top handle. I'll have either the monitor off the side or off the front. And then I have the matte box and a lens, but it just, gives you this really nice, well-balanced setup. And I use, basically put this together just because I am doing documentary work uh, on top of the stuff I do for YouTube. So uh, this is a really nice setup to kind of kit this camera out and have something uh, that you can kind of work with on the fly. So next thing I'll talk about is lenses. I have a bunch of lenses I use, but I think I'll talk about the main ones that I use. 
The first one is the Sigma 18 to 35, and this is just such a good investment if you're doing video work. Uh, there's a couple things I, I'm not a huge fan of about this lens, but there's a lot of things I love. First off is the focal length. So 18 to 35 f 1.8. This lens is made for crop sensor cameras for photography, so like APS-C. It still works on this camera. You almost get a little bit of vignetting at the wide end with the speed booster, but it just gives you this amazing focal length to work with. For me, and the type of work I do, it's like, I would never go wider than this, than 18 mil, and I often don't go longer than 35. And then obviously super fast, 1.8, with the speed booster, it becomes a 1.2. Uh, and it's just a really nice lens, super sharp at all focal lengths, at all apertures. So it's kind of like a no compromise lens where you don't have to worry uh, if you're at a certain you know, focal length or aperture, if it's gonna still perform well. The second lens is actually one that we're filming with right now. So it's the 12 to 35 Panasonic Lumix. I'm not a huge fan of it. The, the things that I like about it are the weight. So it's really compact, super lightweight. It has uh, optical image stabilization built in. And it is kind of like Panasonic's like professional lens for micro four thirds. And we're shooting on the GH5 with it, which is my second camera. And I will use that. I used it on this camera without a speed booster for my recent Fuji GFX video, just because I was traveling and I was doing everything handheld. So it gave me some stabilization, work, which works okay. But it's still, when you're obviously using it just on the Micro Four Thirds sensor and it's an F2.8 lens, so it's not that fast. And it's really hard to get this uh, kind of shallow depth of field look if that's what you're after. So we're, I think we're at 2.8 right now. Uh, I'm pretty close to the camera and you can obviously see how it looks. It's uh, yeah, it's a good lens, but for what I'm looking for, it's a little disappointing uh, in that regard. So this lens I've owned in the past a number of times. I actually just picked another one up recently, and this is my lens to kind of do what the Panasonic's doing. Uh, this is the Canon 17 to 55 f 2.8. It's also made for crop sensor cameras. Uh, it's been around forever, and it's just a super popular lens for video, like dock work. Big thing is the focal length. So 17 to 55 is a really nice range, uh, and then it also has image stabilization as well. So on this camera, it vignettes a little bit with the speed booster, but it gives you a really nice range. F2.8 becomes F2, and then it has stabilization built in. Okay, so last thing we're gonna talk about is filtration. It's an important one with video. I'll start with variable NDs. Those are kind of everyone's go-tos. I have a love-hate with them. I use them all the time, just because it's one of those situations where you kind of have to make compromises. The one that I use is the SimMod Variable ND. This is my favorite out of all the ones I used. For me, it has given me the least color shift. There's almost none. I find this filter leans a little bit green, but uh, as you run through the various stages of uh, ND uh, intensity, the color does not shift. Uh, and until you get right to the end, that's when you get some of that kind of cross hatching that's common with these. But I have been really, really happy with this filter and it has hard stops on either end. So. That would be my recommendation. I also have some solid NDs uh, in the screw-on type Hoya Pro NDs, uh, which are really nice. I've owned these for a long time, super color neutral. So I will use these. I'm running one on the lens right now. Uh, if I'm in a situation where I don't need to worry about, uh, obviously, speed, I'll always go with the solid ND first because then you aren't dealing with any color shifts or any polarization. But I also have this map box and I use this uh, for commercial works or scenarios where I want a top flag and a map box to help with flare. And this is the Polar Pro Base Camp. They just released this, I think like six months ago. And I really, really like this map box system. I had a map box by a company called Bright Tangerine before this, which I also love, but as the type of work that I'm doing shifted, um, this made more sense for me. So the, the big knock on this is that the filters it takes are Polar Pro Pro's own. So they aren't like four by four or four by 5.65. They're filters that are kind of integrated into a tray, which is really nice because you aren't, you know, trying to fit them in and get your fingers on them and stuff. But if you ever wanted to use any other brands of filters, or if you've already invested in some, you can't use them in this map box. But for me and the type of work that I'm doing, I was happy to invest in this system because it's all that I need. I don't need other filters. Um, and when I do run something like a Pro Mist, I run it behind the lens because I have some screw-on lens. The benefits with this system for me are that they've built in a variable ND system as well. So they have a polarizer behind the lens and a little thing on top to adjust it. So if I'm doing running gun stuff and I want a matte box on, I can still 
run a very ND, but still the top flag and a little bit of protection. But then I've also invested in a bunch of Polar Pro's uh, solid NDs, which are really nice. Like I said, again, for doing work where I don't want to have to worry about the polarization. Uh, so super nice system, really lightweight. It fits in line with everything I'm doing. Downside is the price, it's not cheap. Uh, I think the setup that I bought was like $2,500 after I bought all the different filters. So that is something to keep in mind. Obviously, you know, this variant needs like a hundred bucks, but uh, again, I'm using this to do all kind of a wide scope of work, anything from quick YouTube videos to commercial work. So for me, it's important just to invest in the things that make the most sense for me. And then the second camera I own, the last thing I'll talk about is the GH5. We're shooting with it right now. It's a nice camera, I like it, I am replacing it. Uh, the reason I have it is because there still are some situations where I want to be able to have a camera that I don't have to put a monitor on, that has stabilization uh, built in, and that can take some smaller lenses. So the GH5 for me, the stabilization is incredible, it has 4K 10-bit internal video, it has a flip screen so I don't need to run a monitor. And I've shot some videos for my channel on that camera, just where I'm more kind of run and gun and need to, you know, take a camera to lens and, and that's it. Dynamic range is 12 stops, uh, so it's not as nice. There is a noticeable difference from the pocket to the GH5. Uh, and I'm not as big of a fan when it comes to color science on the GH5 as I am the Blackmagic. So I'm actually selling the GH5 and I am going to a Fuji X-T4. I have one on order. Uh, and it basically gives me some things that the GH5 has. So it gives me the flip screen, it gives me internal stabilization, not as good as the GH5, which is probably the best, but it still has some nice stabilization in the body. But then it has a super 35 size sensor, so I can run something like Fuji 16 mil 1.4 and get that shallower depth of field. And it still does 4K 10 bit and stuff like that. So yeah, excited to get that camera. If anyone wants to buy a GH5, let me know, it's gonna be up for sale, but yeah. Hope this helps. Try to keep it as brief as possible. I didn't touch on things like lighting and audio gear, uh, but this video itself, I want to act as this video to go over my gear. So if you have questions, I will be checking these all the time. Happy to answer any other questions when it comes to the lighting or the audio or just anything about this equipment today that we talked about. This is kind of the main gear I use and it's really simple at times. The GFX video I just posted, I use this camera, the pocket with the 12 to 35, which I'm not a huge fan of. Like I said, but it still works. And I ran just a monitor on top and I used that for like three days traveling. Um, sure, there were some times where I wish I had it kitted out a bit different, but in the end it still did the job and I'm happy with the images. So yeah, this is the gear I use, the gear I love. It's ever kind of always changing, um, but this is what's working for me now. And just love this camera, if you couldn't tell. So if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps. Like I always say, my Instagram link is in the description below. Check it out. That's where I post a lot of my work almost daily. And yeah, thank you guys for watching, for the support, the comments, all that stuff. Always appreciate it. We'll see you next week.